Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar, The COVID-19 Patient Pathway for Speech and Language Therapists, The Rehabilitation Journey. Next slide, please. My name is Kamini Gadhock, and I'm Chief Executive at the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. Before we go on to the presentations and the aims and objectives of the webinar, I would like to introduce Rebecca, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the housekeeping. Thank you, Kamini. Um, yes, so I'm on hand today to help you with um, any, anything you need uh, via the chat function. If you have any um, questions that you would like to ask specifically to the speakers, please use the uh, question and answer button um, to do this. Um, we are recording the event today, so um, this will be available on our website early next week. Um, and you will receive a survey after you've attended the webinar today. Any feedback that you have on the webinar is greatly received, so please um, fill that out if you can after the webinar. Um, and as I said, I'm on here to hand help with anything today. Back to you, Kamini. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So let's have a think about what we're going to be covering. So in terms of aims and objectives, we hope that by attending this webinar, you will gain an understanding of the clinical presentations and rehabilitation needs of COVID-19 patients, the RCSLT Intensive Care Society Rehabilitation Pathway, the importance of partnership working for rehabilitation and how speech and language therapists are making a positive impact. Next slide, please. So I'd like to introduce you to our presenters this afternoon. We're absolutely delighted that uh, three key colleagues can join us to help provide, I guess, quite a lot of information from what they've learned around COVID-19 and the input that they've made at a leadership level to support the work that we're doing. So first of all, there's Sarah Wallace, who is consultant speech and language therapist at Withenshaw Hospital, Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust. Alexia Young, who's therapy manager and speech and language therapist at Barking, Havering and Redbridge NHS Trust. And Gemma Clooney, who's clinical specialist speech language therapist for Airways and ENT at Imperial College Healthcare. So without further ado, I'm going to pass to Sarah, to kick off the presentations. Thank you, Kamini, and thank you very much to the RCSLT for this opportunity to participate and share what we've learned about recovery of our patients and reflect really on the rehabilitation needs and how we have been and are going to continue to try to meet this challenge. So let's start by looking at some of the clinical presentations and share what we know. Next slide, please. So if you remember back at the start um, in the early weeks, we were led to believe that respiratory symptoms were the typical signs of COVID. And these actually formed the early criteria for viral testing. But um, we actually know now that in up to 86% of cases, uh, we, using this definition, we are missing a lot of COVID patients and the reports of unusual symptoms are rising worldwide. This is um, a really, um, really well cited study that um, shows that the definition of COVID is much broader than this. So next slide, please. So to provide, um, I think, we, now that, we know now that there are a lot of non-respiratory symptoms and um, one of the main things that's come up is gastrointestinal symptoms. This can actually be the initial manifestation of disease in up to 40% of patients. But what we still don't understand is whether or not this is direct infection of the GI tract or whether there's something else going on that's actually neurological. Loss of taste and smell are now inclusion criteria for testing and are actually really common issues. And a range of cardiovascular symptoms including things like arrhythmias and um, myocardial infarcts are um, also very common. And I can remember actually one of our first coronavirus patients that presented in our intensive care unit was actually admitted with heart failure as the main diagnosis. It caused a lot of debate at the time 
because we didn't really understand that this could, could happen. And we also know that some of these patients have cardiac rehab needs now. And there are lots of issues around clotting, a propensity for clotting causing PEs and strokes. Next slide, please. In addition to that, there are patients who have neurological complications as a result of coronavirus. And this study by Mao actually found um, neuro symptoms in up to 35% of patients. That's a lot of patients. And included in this, the milder symptoms such as brain fog and headaches and dizziness, which actually are common in the mild cases of COVID. But as you can see, lots of other issues, including strokes. Um, and we know that this, the patients who are older are more likely to be the ones who have strokes. And the younger patients are ones who are more affected by altered mental status, actually. But hypoxia is common because of respiratory issues and all sorts of other things like Guillain-Barre syndrome because of the, uh, the inflammatory autoimmune response. Next slide, please. Lots of our patients are affected differently. So children is, uh, are affected differently from the elderly. And what we know is actually in children, um, it's only up to about 2% of children who, who actually develop coronavirus. The disease is generally a lot milder than it is in adults. And their symptoms can be quite unconventional. And very, very rarely it develops to a serious um, Kawasaki-like disease. And this is, um, Kawasaki-like disease is an inflammatory response. It causes an acute vasculitis. And one of the things that can happen is a coronary artery aneurysm. The outward signs are things like rash, fever, and swollen extremities. That's incredibly rare, but has been reported. The other thing that's quite interesting is that children are presenting with steam inhalation burn injuries. And I think it was Birmingham Children's Hospital that has reported a 30-fold increase in children presenting with um, scold injuries because parents are, are using this treatment uh, to alleviate the upper respiratory uh, sore throat uh, symptoms that occur. So that's something else to look out for. Um, in the elderly, at the other end of the spectrum, it's a different problem. We know that it's quite hard sometimes to, to detect coronavirus pneumonia because um, it can be misdiagnosed as, as other things. So if a patient already has a dementia and has confusion and then they have a fall, it's, it's difficult to know whether or not that's a pneumonia causing that or something else. So the problem is that if there's a diagnostic delay, we know that the outcomes are worse for these patients and that transmission is much higher. And we've seen this in, in the awful things that are happening in care homes. And um, I think our, what, what we know is that we, our threshold for testing elderly patients should be lower. Um, generally, most of these patients are not our rehab candidates and they have limited rehab potential. Um, but, you know, I think I think we've learned a lot about how the disease is affecting the elderly and in a really significant way. Next slide, please. So it might help us to just look at the illness severity spectrum and uh, just to remind ourselves that the vast majority of people have a mild disease, so 81%, um, where there's a mild or no pneumonia. And, on average, this resolves within two to three weeks, but we also know there's a long tail effect and some people have a post viral fatigue that can go on for many weeks. Most of these patients are not going to present to hospitals. So we don't know what the rehabilitation needs are actually. And then it's about 20% of cases that have either a severe or a critical um, critical severe reaction to coronavirus and these kind of fall into two groups so we either get a rapid recovery or more persistent moderate severe deficits so these are the patients where our rehab um, has been focused and will need to be focused in the coming months 
and even years, because we know that in the very severe critical criteria group, the 5%, they will have a lot of ongoing lasting problems. Um, they may need specialist airway or voice clinic follow-up as well as complex rehab. We also now understand a little bit about the risk factors for severe disease, um, but there's quite a bit of research going on to look into things like ethnicity and poverty, um, and we don't have the answers yet to that. But if we're going to really understand the rehab needs of these patients, we really need to actually collect large amounts of data. So we have the RCSLT data tool to facilitate that. And I think it's only by co collaborating together and collecting that data and analyzing that, that we can really see what, understand the disease better and understand what we need to be doing to meet the challenge. Next slide, please. And just to give you a bit more information on the severe and critical group and the numbers, this is uh, data as of just last week, 29th of May. We've had um, over 12,000 ICU admissions for over 9,000 patients to date. The mean age um, of admission to ICU uh, is usually 61 years on average, um, but it's a little bit lower in COVID patients. And you can see that in this group, the vast majority, 93%, were actually living independently pre-admission. That compares with 75% normally. So these are pretty fit and well people. We know also that they have a longer length of stay in ICU than usual. And the, the um, mortality rate is about 43%, which is quite a bit higher than normal. So as it stands now, we have uh, about 1,200 patients still in intensive care units around the country and about 4,500 who have been discharged already and the, you know, are needing rehabilitation. So this is our group that we are already seeing and will continue to see. Next slide, please. So let's look a little bit at the rehab needs more closely. Next slide, please. So in, the, in this group, um, we know that there are some potentially lasting complications and these range from um, reduced lung function to um, upper airway complications as a result of intubation, which we'll go into a bit more in a minute, and a whole range of neurological issues around weakness and chronic fatigue syndrome actually is, is um, becoming uh, a known complication. Um, and cognitive impairments. And then I don't know if you're all familiar with post-intensive care syndrome, but this is a recognised collection of symptoms that intensive care patients generally um, suffer from and, again, is, is no different for COVID. And it, it is actually incredibly common. It affects about 80% of patients with a lot of psychological issues, weakness issues, and things like... Um, up to 50% not returning to work within a year. So these patients in, you know, really, really need our intervention. Next slide, please. And I've just tried to collate a little bit of early SLT data for you. So this is um, from a few centres and it's on about 90, 90 patients, I think. And it was, I'm try, trying to demonstrate here the, the prevalence of, uh, of the different issues. So if we look at the ICU patients, the most prevalent issues are actually dysphonia and dysphagia. Um, but quite often there's good, there's good resolution of problems, generally speaking. So if you look at dysphonia, up to 90% of patients in ICU are, are having significant problems with their voice initially but by the time they're discharged, we think it's about five to 12%, but I'll just emphasize this is really early data. Um, about 30% of patients have got both a dysphagia and a dysphonia, and this is obviously related to the fact that a lot of these patients have tracheostomies as well. But again, by the time they're dis discharged from hospital, the, um, the dysphagia is generally resolving relatively quickly, but those who continue to have a problem have got quite significant problems. Um, 
And then if we look at the non-ICU side of it, the biggest is issue is dysphagia, not dysphonia. Um, and you can roughly, I think, split these patients into thirds. So about 20, there, some of them will die, have died, some will be feeding at risk, and some will re require in further intervention. Um, in terms of cognitive communication um, issues, this is a bit of a big unknown at the moment because we haven't followed these patients up for long enough to know what happens when they start to go back and resume their daily lives, um, which is probably more when these uh, issues come to light. So about 15% of patients in this little bit of data were affected here, but I think there's gonna be a bit of a problem further down the line. And these are issues relating to delirium, stroke, hypoxia, and, and again, PICS. Uh, Dysarthria-wise, it's a small group of patients, it, it would seem, and most of these are resolving, but obviously the patients who've had strokes, uh, potentially, or Guillain-Barre may have longer lasting problems. Aphasia is occurring in a small group, again, relating to stroke. And if we look at um, airway, um, we know this is a common concern while patients are in intensive care um, relating to laryngeal edema from COVID itself and intubation. Um, but we are quite concerned about problems occurring later on. And I'd like to hand over to Gemma to talk a bit more about these airway issues. Thank you, Sarah. Next slide, please. Thank you for inviting me to speak as well. Um, so just to think, as Sarah says, a little bit more in detail about why we're seeing um, problems with dysphonia and dysphagia and airway in these patients who've been intubated. Um, and just to take us back to what happens when a patient has an endotracheal tube. Um, you can see in the photographs on the left hand side, um, a patient with an endotracheal or an ET tube in situ. Um, the white arrows in picture A and picture D just show areas of ulceration that will have been caused where the tube has been rubbing. And obviously in COVID patients, we know that they're often prone, so that they are like laying on their tummies um, to help them ventilate, but that obviously has impact for the positioning of the tube as well. And then the red arrow just on the, on the picture that says B is just showing an area of edema in the subglottis um, that can again be caused by the tube being present. And then if you could play the video. This is a patient who didn't have COVID. It's one of Sarah's patients, um, but he had a very traumatic intubation. He had an out of hospital cardiac arrest and was intubated on the pavement. Um, and you can see there that he's got significant areas of ulceration on both vocal cords with also um, a real problem trying to actually close his vocal cords. So they're not fully adducting. Um, and although I don't think the sound is playing, unfortunately, um, so you can't hear the quality of his cough, but it really isn't happening. And this patient was actually aphonic for two weeks and then had a dysphonia that went on for um, a number of months. He had dysphagia, but um, that did resolve relatively quickly. And when we extrapolate this to a COVID population, this gentleman was only intubated for nine days and many of our COVID patients are being intubated for far longer. So we can really start to understand why they're presenting in particular with dysphonia, but also are at risk of other airway issues. Next slide, please. So just to talk briefly about laryngotracheal stenosis, um, this is a condition that causes narrowing of the airways anywhere from the supraglottis to the carina. Um, it can occur acutely, so within intensive care units but it often has a much more insidious and chronic onset. So if you have someone on your caseload that you know was intubated and they start to describe increased problems with their breathing, um, shortness of breath, strider in particular, um, or even just a subtle change in their voice that you might note um, and they're not so bothered by, um, or their swallowing, it's really important at that point to refer them back into a multidisciplinary um, either ENT or airway clinic just to make sure that they're being fully assessed and we're checking to make sure that there hasn't been any stenosis developing over time. Um, in terms of time frames, it usually would develop within about six months after intubation or tracheostomy placement, but for some patients it can be up to a year. Next slide please. 
And just to talk uh, in a little bit more generally about rehab and COVID-19, I think in the current circumstances, it's very easy to be intimidated and feel quite overwhelmed by this new novel virus. Nobody knows exactly how it is going to, you know, treat patients in the years and months to come. Um, but to just remind us all as clinicians to take a step back, take a deep breath, and remember that you already have all of the skills that you need to work with these patients. As speech therapists, we, we never approach a patient as a diagnosis. We always approach a patient as an individual, and it's no different working with a COVID population. Yes, there are potentially more of them on your caseload than you usually have of other things because of the sheer numbers that have been coming through, but to be confident in, in your own knowledge and skills and to use them appropriately. Next slide, please. And in so doing, just focus on the basics. Think about all of the tools that you have available to you to work effectively with these patients, whatever the impairment is that you are working on. Um, use a, a robust assessment in, of whatever you need to. Make sure that you are, as Sarah has already mentioned, using outcome measures to track changes. And when you're using outcome measures with patients, whether you're using the Royal College tool or whether you're using something much simpler with a patient, such as a, a zero to 10 chart of how they're doing every week, um, just make sure that you repeat those regularly, not just at the beginning of a block of therapy and at the end, so that you yourself can see that there are changes happening and that the patient themselves can see that there are changes happening. All of the usual tenets that we would follow in therapy are the same for a COVID-19 population. We need to be setting goals jointly. We need to be working on things in therapy that the patient themselves are concerned about. Um, if you are working with a patient who, for example, has a voice problem, but they don't think of it as a problem, then you're probably not going to get very far in therapy. Um, it's very easy at the moment, I think, to feel quite isolated. And as I've already said, overwhelmed by the sheer strangeness of the current situation. But just remember you're not on your own. You're working with colleagues within an MDT and always seek support and seek the resources that are very much out there. The Royal College, I've put on the left-hand side of that um, slide, has many resources available to you. You've got SENS, you've got Royal College advisors, so use them. And if in the course of therapy things aren't improving and you start to feel as though you're not quite getting as far as you'd like to with a patient, be confident to refer back into um, a medical specialty if necessary, such as neuro or ENT, or you know, refer to other MDT members if you feel that they would be more appropriate to manage the difficulty the patient is presenting with. Next slide, please. And just lastly for this set of slides, I wanted to think about how the individual is the thing that we need to focus on. And to do that, I'm using um, actually the reflections of my colleague, Lindsay um, Lovell, who completed a video philosophy clinic a couple of weeks ago with three patients, all of them on the surface seeming quite similar. They were all three men. They'd all been intubated because of COVID for at least 24 days. They'd all been proned. Um, two of them had no pre-existing conditions. I think patient two had some underlying cardiac condition. Um, but all three of them within the context of the video philosophy were very different. So patient one, he had really quite good airway protection the whole way through the assessment. He presented with more of a critical care myopathy type pattern. Um, so there was residue buildup, but he was very safe to start, restart oral intake of a normal diet and normal fluids straight away. The same wasn't true of patient two. He had much more difficulties with airway penetration across consistencies and silent aspiration on thin fluids. Um, and for him, it was much more challenging because it wasn't possible to come up with a safe consistency for him. And there had to be conversations as we are used to having a speech therapist with him and um, his wife to make sure that he understood that the recommendations that were being made were very much with an acknowledged risk that his, you know, he, he potentially could aspirate. And the third patient, although the still there does show an episode of aspiration that occurred during a thin fluid bolus, actually um, on other consistencies was very safe. His need was around the anxiety that eating and drinking caused him, having been nil by mouth for several weeks. And again, this is something we see in other populations. So just because it's COVID doesn't necessarily make it different. Um, I'm just handing over to Alexia for a case study. Thank you. Thank you for letting me come to speak today. Um, 
with regards to um, the symptoms we've just heard from Gemma and from Sarah, let's put that in the context of what, of what a patient's gone through for their rehab journey. So this is um, a case from BHIUT. This is the speech therapy team that worked with this lady. She was a 69 year old female who was admitted um, on the beginning of April with shortness of breath and required an ITU admission. She had a past medical history of high cholesterol and renal calculi, um, and she was swabbed as being positive for COVID-19. She was intubated for a period of 27 days and had a tracheostomy inserted on day 28. Um, five days post tracheostomy, the speech therapy team were involved with this lady um, and her sedation had been um, reduced at that point. So they were able to do a bit more with her. Um, she was severely weak. weak. Uh, she was unable to use her upper limbs. She had flickers of movement in her fingers. Um, she was starting um, she was starting to participate but found it quite difficult um, she had limited he limited head movement and therefore her yes no was inconsistent um, she was a very slow wean there was an mdt decision um, with the physiotherapist and the medical team and the nursing staff to um, trial an inline speaking valve while she remained on the ventilator this was no at least a minimum of 14 days after she'd been um, positively screened for COVID-19. So it was deemed safe to do so. Um, and she underwent daily rehab from a physical perspective and respiratory weaning on the alternate days to allow her to really maximize her rehab potential. She did some sprint training, which is when you use the inline speaking valves inline speaking valve as a tool to um, uh, use the intercostal muscles but for short periods of time um, and she was able to communicate however presented with a weak dysphonic voice and was unable to use single words but during these initial stages of speaking valve trials she was able to um, do a video call to her family in which she mouthed I love you which was a, a moment that there was not a dry out dry eye in the house. She had poor engagement with AAC, secondary to um, a combination of ITU delirium and um, poor motivation. She was in ITU for a long period of time. Um, but she was able to um, progress with her tracheostomy wean. She completed a swallow assessment while she was on the passing muir valve, the speaking valve, um, and was shown to have other signs of aspiration on thin fluids with some throat clearing on puree. Um, her critical care delirium meant that she was um, not able to participate fully in, in uh, an intensive swallow rehab program. Also, she had fatigue, so that would have limited that. And therefore, she was um, started on swallow trials of three spoonfuls of yogurt three times a day, um, which she clinically tolerated um, and helped with her mood. Um, she, she did present with dysphonia. Um, she recovered within one week of being discharged from the ITU, though, once she had been decannulated. So actually, when she started to progress from a weaning perspective and from a physical perspective, she really improved. Um, she spent 41 days on ITU um, and is now back in the ward managing a level six soft diet and thin fluids. Um, she remains in hospital doing some physical rehab. Um, the team wanted to um, present this case because from a personal perspective and from the humility perspective, um, she wore red lipstick most days. Um, she was repeatedly asking for a glass of champagne. Um, and she had hundreds of, of letters stuck up all around her room that her, um, from her family and the ability to communicate with her family was a really, um, a really important part of her rehabilitation journey. Um, in fact, the photo you can see on the screen now is um, when it was organised during her birthday, once her um, COVID-19 swab had come back negative, that she could meet with her family outside of the hospital to celebrate her birthday. So this is just one patient's journey during that um, COVID-19. I'm going to hand back to Sarah now to give you some more details about um, the rehab pathway.
Yeah, thank you, Alexia. So we're going to come back to a few more case studies later on. Um, but what what we've developed, I wanted to talk about um, the rehab pathway that we've developed to help you plan your rehab services. Um, and this came about through a piece of work being done by the Intensive Care Society, ICS, which started about five weeks ago. Um, that It feels like more like a year ago, actually. <laughs> um, they, they set up a national rehab forum um, with the aim to develop a really a gold standard rehab pathway, not just for COVID patients, but which could be applicable to all our patients going forward. I think COVID was the driver, but the, you know it needed to be something that we could use with everybody because we want equity of care, don't we, for our patients. And it was an, a truly multi-agency collaboration. Um, so calls I was on had like over 50 people from all different uh, professions and agencies, um, including International Olympic Committee, Hetley Court, um, you know, the whole gamut of people involved in rehab. It also was building on foundation work done by British Society of Rehab Medicine. And um, one of the things that was apparent from the start was that people, uh, the medics particularly, were very concerned about airway um, and voice issues in patients. So. We actually, as speech and language therapists, had a very high profile right from the very beginning and were given um, a work stream to do to build this rehab pathway with ENT to uh, look at how we might tackle um, rehab for these particular issues. Next slide, please. And, and sorry, I'll just say that's available on the, the RCSLT website. We were actually given permission to release our um, deep dive section early. The actual ICS rehab framework, the overarching framework is, is not actually published yet. There's a little bit of work still being done to bring everybody's bits together. So one of the purposes of showing you this flowchart here is to show you how the pathway works. So as soon as a patient is discharged from ICU, the idea is that any, needs that have not been um, picked up will be picked up on the ward and they've actually developed a screening tool or we've developed a screening tool called the pickups um, which stands for post intensive care unit presentation screen so it's quite a, a natty title but the idea is that if a patient for some reason hasn't seen speech and language therapy uh, on ICU which we know is an issue because we're not always there and we're not always part of that uh, set up we don't have staff etc that this tool will be delivered when the patient goes to the ward um, and it will identify need for a referral to any of the people in the blue boxes uh, for further assessment um, by each professional um, and the assessments we've had you know we've had to look at what kind of outcome measures might be built into this tool as well and actually then set out what we as speech and language therapists do um, at, at different time points. So from this, you could actually write a rehab prescription for your patient, if you look at the green box on the right, and treatment plans uh, whilst the patient's still in hospital. Can you move on to the next slide, please? So just to carry on the flow, um, the screening tool has got some additional sections if you want to investigate further so they've called that the pickups plus so if you identify um, something around swallowing you can do go into that in a little bit more detail um, and carry out more specialist assessment and by the end of this you've got orange boxes which should basically pick up whether your patient needs specialist rehab or follow up in community or you know just what level of intervention they then require so um, we don't know the numbers of patients yet who need complex rehabilitation because it's too early to tell but there's quite a few people collecting data and data uh, collection was built into this piece of work by intensive care society as well um, and we can obviously link in our RCSLT data into that larger piece of work. 
So this has probably been one of the most collaborative uh, projects I've ever been involved with actually. And it's the, the, the sort of speed that this has been done at as with everything with COVID has been really impressive. Um, and as I say, we have our deep dive speech therapy section there to guide you. And part of that, if you look at it, is uh, has outcome measures that we might use and different indicators for even um, GPs in primary care and how they might pick up a problem. Say a patient uh, turns up for an appointment uh, with their GP and says, actually, you know, I think I'm struggling a little bit with my communication. Then a GP can follow the advice that we, we're giving. And we're also developing a nice infographic uh, some poster for GPs which will indicate to them the types of issues that we would need to see a patient and that's again a whole um, AHP infographic so it's got issues that would flag referral to physio to speech therapy to dietetics or whatever so fantastic piece of work and it's there for you to use um, if you can just move on to the next slide please I'll just show you some of the parameters um, it's not you know obviously can't read the detail on there but just to say to you that we've built into that um, parameters which will uh, highlight problems with breathlessness swallowing voice um, and cognition and communication so um, hopefully we won't be missing any patients um, and if we do miss them when they're in hospital we should be able to uh, you know pick these patients up later down the line so um, I'm going to hand back to Gemma to talk a little bit more about the voice aspect. Thank you. So um, I know that there's been a lot of um, questions to college around how to manage voice disorder and upper airway patients in the current um, times, especially when patients haven't necessarily had um, an endoscopic evaluation of their larynx because of you know, uh, risk mitigation and avoidance of aerosol generated procedures. Um, just to flag to everybody watching that the guidance, um, the Royal College guidance for this cohort of patients was published probably about an hour ago on the website. So you can now access it there. Um, and I'm just going to talk through a couple of key points that are in that guidance for um, those people working with um, patients within this cohort. Um, a really key thing is that whereas usually if patients haven't had a laryngoscopy, speech therapist would generally not, would, would not accept a referral. In these circumstances, the guidance states that you are able to offer therapy as long as that therapy is being provided as part of a multidisciplinary team. And that can be either with an ENT surgeon or with a respiratory physician that you work closely enough with. If you need to re-refer that patient, it is a straightforward process. Obviously, it's also really important that the patients that you're working with um, and providing therapy to understand the limitations of any clinical impression or um, initial kind of suggested diagnosis that they may have been given when they haven't had a direct, um, no one's actually looked at their vocal cords. Um, and you as a therapist need to make sure that that is clear to them. Um, it's also very important, I think, in this context to have very robust referral criteria. The guidance itself comes with um, an appendix, I think it's Appendix A, um, as a referral checklist and I highly recommend that you use that and you give it to your colleagues to make sure that the referral, the details that you're getting are enough to be able to provide um, you know, good therapy or the best sort of therapy that we can within this, um, within this cohort. If you are going ahead and, and working with these patients then obviously telehealth will be the way that you're likely to be delivering um, therapy and college has already produced some excellent guidance around how to um, fulfill that. It's also really important to thoroughly risk assess both from a patient perspective, a therapist perspective and a service perspective how that therapy is being delivered. I think there was a, there's been a question about when to resume face-to-face -face outpatient um, therapy Realistically, that is going to alter from service to service. Um, so you need to go back to your managers and, and work out the, the best and safest way of, of restarting those um, elements of speech therapy. Um, and I think it's just really important as well to remember that if you are providing um, therapy for a patient who hasn't been scoped, 
then and you aren't able to use, for example, endoscopic evaluation of the larynx as biofeedback, any therapy that you're doing may um, take longer to um, be effective. So don't lose heart if things aren't changing as quickly as they usually would. But at the same time, if you start having concerns that you know someone isn't responding to your therapy or that their voice is deteriorating or their upper airway symptoms are deteriorating, then have a really low threshold of referring them back into an MDT in order to be able to be assessed more thoroughly. Next slide, please. And just uh, some last points for me around dysphonia. If you are working with these patients, but you don't feel able to provide therapy and you're just sort of waiting to see if they can be scoped and you want to be able to give some advice, or maybe you've just got someone with very mild difficulties that have been referred to you from a GP, there's lots of advice that you can give that may well make quite a significant impact on their voice in quite a short period of time. Um, most of it is common sense, like drinking enough water and not smoking. But some things like um, trying to think about the voice as, well, always think about the voice as something that's driven by muscular function and muscles get tired. And so if you've got someone who's using their voice too much, then they're not going to recover as quickly. Recommend little and often, the same as we would when you're eating and drinking. And um, if you've got someone with dysphagia, make sure that someone's resting. Always ensure that the GP has been treating reflux or hay fever, anything that might be aggravating a cough. With a post-viral sy syndrome in COVID, it's very likely that patients might be really struggling with the, the coughing pattern. And it's important as much as possible to try and break bad habits before they start. So advising sips of water as opposed to coughing is, is a really simple method of, of helping someone over that initial hurdle. There's lots of advice on the BLA website that I would direct you to. Um, and as I say, there's an awful lot out there um, that can be very supportive. So make use of the resources that are there. Um, handing over to Alexia for another case study. Thank you. So on the back of that dysphonia information from Gemma, this gentleman um, is uh, from the team who work at St. Richard's Hospital in Chichester. He was admitted at the beginning of uh, March. He was um, COVID-19 positive and required intubation and ventilation secondary um, to respiratory distress. He um, was intubated for a total of 12 days um, and he had failed extubation during that time secondary to secretion mode. From a communication perspective, he had a moderate dysarthria. His voice was mild to moderately weak and wet with um, reduced pulmonary support. He had concerns with regards to um, uh, saliva pooling um, and reduced sensation and awareness. There was a concern he was either delirious or, and or presented with a cognitive communication disorder, um, secondary to hypoxia. From a swallow perspective, he had a moderate to severe dysphagia. He was um, nil by mouth with NGT feeding um, and um, had a critical illness myopathy, which was um, thought to be the underlying cause of his dysphagia. Um, he also had a poor respiratory breath, um, poor respiratory swallow uh, coordination, and therefore was unsafe for oral intake. Um, a week after that initial diagnosis from the speech therapist, he was upgraded to a level six soft and bite-sized diet. Um, he had ongoing signs of penetration and aspiration across fluid consistencies. Um, and despite trying different compensatory strategies, um, he, he was unable to have anything from a fluid perspective. His voice remained weak at that point. And in the absence of endoscopy, they were unable to start any voice therapy. Um, a week later, um, ongoing difficulties with um, with upgrading to fluids. He continued to present with cognitive and communication changes. And so the SLT was instrumental in asking for further neurological assessment. Um, an MRI was completed, which came back um, inconclusive. There was no concerns. Um, and a neuro rehabilitation assessment was then um, requested. Um, and they thought there was cognition and communication changes um, likely to prolong delirium and then hypoxia. Um, a couple of days later, um, the gentleman was um, really 
quite low in motivation, secondary to um, not being able to manage fluids. He really didn't enjoy um, any of the thickener trials. And therefore it was decided that he would go on a, um, a Fraser free water protocol. This was to um, increase his motivation, um, increase the therapeutic relationship he had with his speech therapist, um, and also from a quality of life perspective was really important for him. It helped maintain good mouth care. Um, and he was, um, there was a joint discussion with the, with the MDT about um, going forward with this. Um, and at the time, you know, it's a, it's a novel condition, COVID-19. We don't, we know it affects the respiratory system. However, the risk was deemed um, necessary in the context of what this patient was experiencing. Um, so they, they gently increased the fluid intake over the next couple of days um, with no changes in chest status. Um, and then he continued to have some thickened fluids um, for the rest of his, if he wanted a cup of tea, that's when he would have those. Um, he was discharged home on a level six diet that was soft and bite-sized, um, continuing with the Fraser free water protocol at home um, and level three for all of the fluids. His mild dysphonia was ongoing um, and he has um, a mild dysarthria and COGCOM, which the community speech therapist has been referred for. Um, he will, there's a max fax referral has gone in with regards to doing an endoscopy. Um, and the, the outcome of that were, um, there was a laryngeal edema with pooling of saliva but there were nil, nil concerns with regard to vocal cord function. Um, so I think that just kind of shows, even in the highlight of us not having um, access as a speech therapy profession to endoscopy, involving the MDT really gives us more of a, a breadth of, of information about how we can treat these patients. And although we can't necessarily do a standardized rehabilitation approach, there are things we can do that we can positively impact on that patient's experience of, of what the COVID-19 rehab journey looks like. Next slide, please. Um, and I think we need to think about um, how speech therapists have worked within the context of this um, pandemic. It's not just all being focused in the acute setting. Um, it's been across all primary and, and secondary healthcare. Um, areas. So there's been a lot of redeployment. Um, risk assessments were early put in place for um, members of staff to make sure that they were um, in the right areas working with the right type of patients and if not still able to contribute to um, helping um, but maybe from a non-clinical perspective. Workforce hubs have helped um, create a easy and um, transferable way of working with these members of staff to make sure that they can offer some assistance, whether it be within their usual role as a speech therapist or maybe doing something in, in an office to help with um, a helping hands team who might be going out to, to work with the, uh, the higher acuity wards. Um, speech therapy teams across the country have been really keen to be involved in seven day working. So they've quickly um, altered roster patterns, whether it be extended days, whether it be doing overtime on a weekend, they really um, stood up and, and made the active decision to, to do something different. Um, and junior staff who potentially wouldn't have worked in intensive care environments have stood up and have um, been part of the intensive care team, just not as speech therapy, so maybe working as a HCA, um, participating in proning teams, or working um, to do mass cares, um, but when nursing staff have been particularly um, low in numbers. Next slide, please. Um, and we know that the rehab journey um, continues into the community. So, um, you know, the acute and community teams across the country have been working in partnership um, with regards to timing of transfer. So um, maybe, tran um, maybe, getting patients out of hospital earlier than would have necessarily been done previously, but to ensure that they were um, put at least risk from COVID-19 um, and the resources have been moved to the community in certain areas, extra beds have been created from a rehab perspective so that they can um, be provided in a, 
in a COVID free area. Um, peer support, so teaching programs have existed um, to support one another. For example, in the beginning when, um, when we, everyone was working up to what this potentially could look like, tracheostomy teaching for our community partners to ensure that they'd had training, to, to um, prepare them for what they might need to, to work with, to make sure people felt safe and empowered to do so. Um, a single point of access, so one referral form for many different um, areas, um, for example, in Barking, Havering and Redbridge, um, one hospital covers 750,000 people. That's three different boroughs that they will, um, with three different referral systems. And yet those, those boroughs were happy to have one point of, of access for um, those referrals to go out through. So that was really useful. And then a, lenient, a leniency in acceptance criteria, just to make sure the patient is moved through the pathway as early as possible. Next slide, please. Um, so more so, the, the community have offered distance supervision. So for those who have not been able to have a one-to-one -one with their supervisors, they've had um, virtual supervision. Um, we've had paediatric speech therapists, with, for example, within NELFT, North East London Foundation Trust. Um, we've had they all trained in dysphagia um, in advance to try and to try and be ready for what that rehab community could look like from a patient cohort perspective. Um, there's a tweet um, from one of the pediatric speech therapists within NELFT who felt very supported. Um, condensed competency training programs have gone on to make sure that people have the exact skills. And I think speech therapy have responded to this really well as a profession. Um, what, you know, with regards to um, mouth care, for example, of junior members of staff, they're going into an area they will have never seen before, but making sure they have the right information, not too much, not too little, but to feel empowered and safe when they walk onto such an intense, um, intense learning environment. Um, and e-learning swallow awareness packages for our nursing homes. So whereas we would normally be going in to do those um, assessments and those treatments with those patients, that we have empowered nursing colleagues within, the, within those sectors to make sure that they can look after these patients and feel safe doing so. Next slide, please. Um, and just to talk about telehealth, I know there's a webinar next week for, um, that the Royal College are, are hosting. I think it's next Friday. But um, telehealth experiences, rehab doesn't just have to be done face to face. It is possible to do it virtually. So, um, you know, whether if it's the experiences from our community colleagues have been that they need to make sessions short if it's people who've got cognitive communication problems just to maximise attention. Um, make sure that the video systems they're using are encrypted from a, um, a clinical governance perspective so that they, they're still a clinical record. Um, using a combination of physical objects to um, make sure that the rehab that they're doing is, is relevant and is given in more than one medium of communication. And creating activities that you can jointly participate with a patient in so that you are doing um, active therapy with them that keeps them motivated, that is, um, that is uh, go going to work for them, but also is, is going to help with that recovery. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just an example of, even in the pandemic, how successful speech therapy as a profession has been. There have been so many successes um, and just shows the ingenuity and the innovation of what speech therapists are like. So from, um, these are all taken from, from social media, but um, just some examples. We've had multi-professional podcasts going on with regards to how can we empower our colleagues let's get the uh, most up-to-date information as soon as possible we've had speech therapists going to be trained as fit mask testing so that um, we can get more people into those COVID-19 areas quicker we've had both national and local um, TV uh, appearances from our speech therapy colleagues we were looking at alternative um, assessment possibilities like using ultrasound instead of video fluoroscopy 
and fees when it wasn't available. We, and then we've had um, the human element of this all is personalizing who we are, communicating through all that PPE, whether you know, a mask, an FFP3 um, mask specifically, or whether it be a visor, just adding a bit of a personal touch and adding that humility so that your patients can see who you are and actually remember that there is a person working with them here because that helps with your therapeutic um, relationships and your communication in general. So I think um, as part of this rehab journey, it's really important to remember that speech therapy have been um, at the forefront of innovation and ingenuity and have really, um, really paved the way on, on how to respond to a crisis. Kamini, I'll pass back to you for questions. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think that was really interesting. Thanks to Sarah, to Alexia and to Gemma. Uh, we've had a number of questions that have come in as you've been doing your presentation. So I'm going to do my best to go through those and suggest who might want to answer them. But of course, we'll open up the floor, so to speak, to others. Um, I think the first one may be for Sarah, which is, do you think that the pressure for ITU beds has meant that older people were not deemed to meet the criteria for ventilation? Oh, that's political, isn't it? Um, so I don't think that's the case, actually. I think that they have used the criteria that they've always used around um, frailty and risk versus benefits for critical care intervention. So we know that critical care interventions carry, you know, awful risks uh, and poor outcomes for people who are very frail, um, very, you know, very elderly and um, are often potentially futile. And putting somebody um, on a ventilator when you run the risk that you can't actually get them off the ventilator is not, um, is not kind it's not uh, to serving any benefit to the patient uh, or their families so I actually think although that has been in the press that that's you know it's all about rationing beds I don't think that that's in reality what's happened they've got criteria around frailty um, and it's all probably tightened up that kind of decision making that was already happening um, but it's very much about looking at whether a patient is going to benefit from those significant interventions that can actually um, you know not necessarily lead to a good outcome and what we're looking at is good functional outcomes for patients you know intensive care isn't uh, isn't just about saving a life it's about survivorship and it's about functional outcomes and that's why um, the the intensive care society have been sort of moving their focus a lot towards rehabilitation because you can't rehabilitate those patients who are very very frail and you put them on a ventilator um, so so yeah I guess that's my response to that. Thank you I don't know if uh, Gemma or Alexia wanted to add to that at all. You come in okay um so at the other end of the scale somebody has asked about um whether we're envisaging a cohort of patients who were not treated in hospital i.e who recovered from covid at home but may present to community services with mild or insidious symptoms like residual mild respiratory dysphagia and fatigue impacting on voice or swallow who wants to have a go at that one I think I think absolutely. I think it's highly likely that we will. I've already spoken to patients, for example, on our current voice caseload who had actually been doing really well with their therapy and have contracted COVID and have, have experienced a deterioration in their dysphonia symptoms and have been finding that their swallowing has been affected by their breathing patterns. So absolutely, I think we have to be on the lookout for these patients who had mild illness but still have significant impairments in terms of how they're able to kind of carry out their daily lives and what we've got to remember as well especially in terms of voice is that we're all being expected to use all of these different methods of communication now and that puts quite a strain on your voice even if you've only had very mild illness so it's a, it's a great question and I think the answer is yes. Okay thank you and maybe for you Gemma um, somebody put in a question before we started about whether you look at rehab through a voice 
rehab lens or a disaster disaster rehab lens yeah and again i think that depends very much on the on the individual that you're working with if you know that there's an underlying neurological um issue then you might be thinking along more of the lines of a disarthrophonia type pattern um but if there isn't any evidence of neurological involvement then you might be expecting and you know that there's been some structural damage for example because some patients are being scoped in hospital and you will know that there was some damage to their vocal cords then you might be focusing more on the sort of more of a pure dysphonia but realistically it's it's going to depend very much on the person that you have in front of you can i just add a bit to that as well Cameron? so one of the things is um whether these patients may present to their gp um, they've never been to hospital because they had, um, you know, didn't have a severe enough illness. But if they present to their GP, we've actually got advice for the GPs around what kind of questions to um, ask a patient to delve into a, pot, a potential voice or cognitive communication or, or swallowing issue to to help to trigger referral to speech therapy. So there's guidance there for primary care to to uh, flag these patients back to us if, if they're presenting with a problem down the line. Thank you, and that links to the next question which somebody's asked about the pickups tool. Um, do you want to just, I think you mentioned in your presentation, Sarah, that the main um, guidance from the Intensive Care Society hasn't been published yet. Do you want to just talk about where people could find the tool or do you know of any timelines if it's not been formally published by the ICS? Um, so the, 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 I had an email yesterday from ICS to say that they were just making some more final um, tweaks to that. So I don't know exactly when it'll be published, but I've, hopefully soon, I mean, I, within a weeks. But within the RCSLT document um, that is already on the website, you can see um, our information around triaging and the pickups tool. Um, parameters are there but um, if, I can always email people if they want to ask more about that until it's available by IC, from ICS. Thank you um, and then we've had a number of questions on the knotty issue of uh, SLT led endoscopy procedures. Sarah do you want to just give an update on where we are um, on that please? Sure so we we had um, the initial paper that went out the initial guidance and there was a deadline for um, response via survey monkey of 31st of May for us to um, see what whether what the issues were around how that was working for people um, so we have on the back of that started to make revisions to that guidance and um, we've got another call on Monday to hopefully iron out um, the, the changes to uh, reflect i suppose the changing situation that we're in anyway around covid um, and the sort of in enhanced segregation of patients or cohorting of patients so so we will be making some changes there and revisions to that document hopefully next week thanks uh, for, for those who are on on listening in do you want to just say the history of where we started so when covid19 um and the pandemic hit there was a, a decision was it through ENT UK uh to say that speech therapy should stop all endoscopy procedures and then this paper the guidance that was released recently was to help support members to restart I'm not sure if colleagues are aware of that history do you want to just provide a bit of that background that would be helpful yeah, I think you've you've hit the nail on the head anyway but yeah it was it was uh, initially I think when everyone was trying to uh, get to grips with the whole problem around aerosol generating procedures and endoscopy um, flagged as a, a you know significant um, risk to staff and all procedures around endoscopy were stopped including things like bronchoscopies, um, ENT endoscopies and so we had to stop doing endoscopy for voice or fees uh, and all of our investigations so obviously we needed some interim guidance to address the issue of patients for instance who are in who are in ICU with potential airway problems or tracheostomy weaning issues where we needed to carry out essential endoscopy and obviously we're now moving into another phase um, so our revision to the guidance will reflect that 
Thank you very much. And similarly, for those who've asked about VF, we are working on guidance around video fluoroscopy. We are keen that that's an MDT piece of work. So as far as possible, we only had our first meeting yesterday by Zoom uh, with members who are going to help to look at uh, guidance around video fluoroscopy for those who are also questioning where we are with that. Um, so I'm just looking at other questions that have come in. Um, we've said somebody said that they work in a community providing a community voice service after ENT assessment and they're not part of an MDT and don't have access to ENT other than through a GP so does that mean they should be, should not be seeing COVID voice patients? I think it's it's very tricky when you're in that situation that's one of the things we were trying to cover in the guidance is that maybe where you have been providing a service and you have an appropriate referral what you need to try and do is to work on your referral pathways back in i saw that question and i saw that they've said that they have to go back via gp and i think that's one thing that when we were working on the guidance we were most concerned about that we didn't want patients to have to kind of go back through gp and wait for a really long time to be seen and um, which is always the risk if you're going to be completing therapy and you haven't got that easy access back in um, there are some, um, there's a couple of appendices that actually give some nice flow charts of how that could look if you're trying to kind of adjust your service to provide, to be able to continue to provide voice therapy in that context. But realistically, if you, if you don't have that easy access, then it, it, there is de definitely a lot of potential risk both to you, to the patient, to your service as a whole. And it needs to be something that's decided from a sort of local perspective, but I would be quite wary of it. Can I just add to that as well? I think um, now the, the wave is, is, is um, going back down. I think this is the perfect time before elective, um, elective pathways are reopened to really integrate with the local CCGs. The NHS is not going to go back to how it's ever worked before. This is the perfect time to start liaising with those um, funding partners that you have. You know, tell, tell a patient story, get some data on how many patients are going to have to go through these pathways and connect with the CCGs because we have a real opportunity at the moment to be part of what the next um, care pathways look like. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've had a question with respect to how the rehab prescriptions might be communicated, but I think this is something that's not been even published yet, but I don't know, Sarah, have there been any ideas about, about that coming out through the ICS? Um, no, I haven't got a clear answer on that one yet. I think yeah. it's, still, it's still being um, written up around clarif clarifying that, actually. Okay, good, good point. So just to say this is still very early days um, and just for colleagues to note that NHS England have got a workshop session starting next week to look at the rehab pathway. Um, so, you know, we are still in very early days. So, so obviously keep watching. Somebody's also asked about whether there's an opportunity to share and centralise any learning and training. Um, and that's something that we can look at post this webinar. Another question was around e-learning for dysphagia and care homes and Alexia mentioned some work she's done but just to let you all know that um, we are working with one of our members with Higher Education England to put some e-learning around dysphagia, dysphagia linked to competencies um, onto the Higher Education England e-learning platform but we'll make sure you're all made aware of that when that sort of work gets completed. If I go back to the questions, um, Someone has, let's just have a look at what might not have been answered. Somebody's asked about whether you can recommend a COGCOM screen for use in acute settings. I don't know if any of you have a... Yep, so one of the, one of the ones that we've mentioned um, is the Latrobe questionnaire. So there's, uh, it's quite lengthy, but I think that's, that's one of the ones that I think people like, like best, so not particularly Thank my you. area of specialty but that and i have to confess i've never used that but that's that's definitely one that we've suggested but that that is all again um i hate to sound like a broken record but that's in our rcslt pathway guidance um, there's a whole table at the back which um looks at each clinical area 
with some suggested assessments and outcome tools. So have okay. a look at that. Thank you. Quite a few questions about what, what information is being provided to GPs. And as I think we've highlighted, that's not finished yet. That work is currently underway. So if you hang on, we'll let you know. If somebody's asked a question about working with uh, patients or service users with cerebral palsy and learning disability, but it's quite a complex question. So I think we should pick that up after this webinar. Um, there are... There's one question about using throat sweets, but I'm not sure who, if Gemma, if you want to look at that one. Yeah, that's fine. Um, thanks for clarifying that, actually. I think it was Amy who asked that question. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, throat sweets, the problem is when they're medicated. So if they have any kind of anaesthetic effect or any ingredients that might irritate the vocal cords, then they will tend to make things worse. Obviously, if you've got a patient with a very dry mouth or sort of who is throat clearing a lot, then it's perfectly fine for them to chew gum to try and promote saliva and um, try and minimise some of those in the impact of sort of throat clearing. And, you know, sweets, actual just proper sweets are also OK, although probably sugar free would be preferable. Um, but the, the real problem is when it's those kind of medicated sweets that people like to buy, like the halls and the, that kind of thing. They just aren't very good for your um, laryngeal structures. Um, someone asked a very specific question about a professional opera singer in their 40s, whether he or she could ever fully ex recover from a month of intubation. Is that a, one that where it's very individualised? I don't know what do you Yeah, think? I, I think yeah. without knowing that patient, without knowing yes. their, their history, it's impossible to give an answer to that. I saw that question and I appreciate that. I'm sure that that patient is under unbelievable stress and strain because of what's happened to them um but it's it's very likely to you know i would need to know them to be able to answer sorry if if that person wants to get in touch with you for some advice that would be okay all right that's fine then um so uh i'm just seeing if there's anything else that we can answer at the moment um so somebody's asked about HE's uh, work, will that work be available nationwide? Yes, it's open access. So as far as I know, it will be. Uh, we, we really make, want to make sure that it actually is. Um, somebody else has said they are also working with clients with learning disability and cerebral palsy. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. So I think the question, I don't know if any of you feel able to answer it. It is quite, um, so they're working with someone who's struggling to restart oral feeding two months after initial admission to hospital. The person wasn't intubated or in ICU, was on normal fluids and level five food prior to admission. Um, I think, again, I'm just concerned this is quite specific to a, a one patient, but I don't know if you have any thoughts on that question around uh, patients who have pre-existing issues around eating and drinking and swallowing. Any, no, general? I, I so just I think, think that, yeah, sorry, so, yeah, carry on, yeah. I was just going to say that I think what we are learning from COVID is that some people can be absolutely knocked sideways by it. And if you already have an underlying condition, um, you know, this is, this is where COVID can really impact. And, a, you know, a potential problem that you had with your swallowing or your voice or, or communication before, can seriously deteriorate and we don't know how long it takes for people to recover and we do know that there are post-viral issues so I just think that um, I mean cerebral palsy is not my area of expertise but I think the, the, the thing is that some of your patients who have other problems who get COVID are going to be impacted I think that's something we're seeing over and over again so okay but some, somebody else with that, that area of expertise is probably better to advise it than I am. Okay, thank you. So I think what, what, what I'm hearing is that there's, you know, we're still very much learning about the clinical presentation that um, patients have from having had COVID-19. And obviously, as I think you've all said, um, it's very individual. There's a lot of... Um, factors that can impact on that one individual so there isn't a one-size-fits-all but I think we're used to that as speech language therapists that our role is very much to provide that holistic assessment and intervention program and in terms
terms of recovery, again, there will be a number of factors that might impact on the recovery of that individual. So what is really important is that we work collaboratively and that we collect data to, so that we can show the impact and the outcomes of um, the approaches that we use. And what I am also picking up from seeing the questions is about how we can share resources, which I think we're obviously all very, very keen to do. Thank you so much. Um, I think those are the key questions that I think would be probably appropriate to answer at the moment on the webinar itself. Um, people have asked about access to the slides. And of course, I think um, for those of you who are not didn't hear us at the beginning, that this webinar will be posted. So you'll be able to also hear the recording. We're very keen that you share this with your colleagues. You know, do encourage others who haven't been able to tune in to listen and uh, we will of course be um, as we things move and change we will be looking to see how how else we can continue to update you um, and just to remind you as Ale Alexia said earlier that the next webinar next Friday which is the 12th of June is going to be on telehealth and that will be at one o'clock so we do hope that you can join us but I want to say a really big thank you to all the panelists that uh, you know have been working really hard and at speed to put the presentation together, but also uh, working hard to help share um, their learning because it is all very new information. Um, so thank you to all of you. And I hope that everyone has, who's joined us today has found this an informative web webinar. So thanks again and have a good weekend. Thank you.